The last set of terms we'll look at for expressing conditional relationships involve the concepts of necessity and sufficiency. If I become rich, then I'll be happy. Here's a question. When I say this, am I saying that becoming rich is necessary for me to be happy? If I say that becoming rich is necessary for my happiness, then I'm saying that there's no way for me to be happy unless I'm rich. And that doesn't seem right. What does seem right is to say that my becoming rich is sufficient for my being happy. Sufficient means that it's enough to guarantee that I'll be happy. But it doesn't imply that becoming rich is the only way that I can be happy. My becoming rich is sufficient for my happiness, but it's not necessary for it. In terms of the antecedent and the consequent of the original conditional, we can say that if A then B implies that A is sufficient for B. Or, in other words, the antecedent is sufficient to establish the consequent. This is our first general rule. The conditional can always be translated into a sentence stating that the truth of the antecedent is sufficient to ensure the truth of the consequent. So, how do you interpret the language of necessity? Well, let's go back to our original claim. If I become rich, then I'll be happy. We can't say that A is necessary for B. But we can say that B is necessary for A. In other words, we can't say that my being rich is necessary for my happiness, but we can say that my happiness is a necessary consequence of my being rich. In other words, if I end up rich, then I'm necessarily happy. So relationships of necessity and relationships of sufficiency are converses of one another. If A is sufficient for B, then B is necessary for A. It's easier to see if you have the rules side by side. When you see a claim of the form A is sufficient for B, then you read that as saying that if A is true, then B is guaranteed. The truth of A is sufficient for the truth of B. When you see a claim of the form A is necessary for B, then you should imagine flipping the conditional around because the B term is now playing the role of the antecedent. Another way of stating the rule for necessary is to express it in terms of the contrapositive. If not A, then not B. The only way to make this clear is to look at some examples. Oxygen is necessary for combustion. This doesn't mean that if there's oxygen in the room, then something is going to combust. Matches don't spontaneously burst into flame just because there's oxygen in the room. What it says is that if there's combustion going on, then you know that oxygen must be present. And you would write that like this. If there's combustion, then there's oxygen. Or you could write it in the contrapositive form. If there's no oxygen, then there's no combustion. Either way will do. Let's do an example working the other way. We're given the conditional, if I have a driver's license, then I passed a driver's test. How do we write this in terms of necessary and sufficient conditions? Well, how about this? Having a driver's license is necessary for passing a driver's test. Does this work? No, it doesn't. It'd be very odd to say this since it implies that you already have to have a driver's license in order to pass a driver's test. We need to switch these around. Passing a driver's test is necessary for having a driver's license. Using the language of sufficiency, you'll reverse these. Having a driver's license is sufficient for passing a driver's test. This is a little awkward, but the logic is right. If you know that someone has a driver's license, that's sufficient to guarantee that at some point they passed a driver's test. Finally, I want to draw attention to the parallels between the language of necessary and sufficient conditions and the language of if and only if. These function in exactly the same way. Both emphasize that a conditional relationship only goes one way, and that if you can establish that both are true, then you've established a biconditional relationship. If A is true, then B is true, and vice versa. Well, that's it for this section on the different ways we express conditionals in ordinary language. I know from experience that mastering the rules that we've been discussing in these last few tutorials really does make you become aware of logical relationships. And by itself, this will help you to detect errors in reasoning and help you to be clear and precise in your own reasoning.